grip our King And come let us bow at His feet He has done great things See what our Savior has done See how His love overcomes He has done great things has done great things. O oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken the life. O oh, Jesus, the Savior, the name lifted high. Oh God. Have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. But you have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. Oh God, you do great things. Oh hero of heaven, you conquer the slave. Free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. Death in your freedom, awaken the life. Oh, Jesus, the Savior, the name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah. to worship, so will I. 
him and thank him in song this morning. He is the God who makes us alive, who sustains us and molds and shapes us, the one who gives us hope. We praise him and thank him together this morning. Let's continue. Was dead in my transgressions, wandering in sin. I went searching for redemption down a road that had no end. I was walking through the fire. I was living on the run with my flesh lost in desire. I was drowning in the blood, but God. Rich in mercy, you came to save me, now I'm alive, but 
walk for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. The sun sets free, oh, it's free in peace. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am in my Father's house. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. The sun sets me. Oh, it's But I love God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I but I love God, yes I am. I but I love God. Yes, I am. I'm a child of God. Yes, I I bow my life at 
fix my eyes on Christ my King. I bow my life, I fix my eyes on Christ my King. Oh, present day, this day, this Jesus, my Savior's morning. Earlier this week, uh, I received a letter uh, from Weldon Buey. Now, Weldon Buey is the founder of this church, and uh, Weldon's the fellow who hired me as his associate a very long time ago. And uh, Weldon and Lydia live in Birmingham. Weldon is 96, and Lydia is 97. And uh, he has to retire only because he has macular regeneration. He can't get a Bible big enough, he said, to read the letters to teach. What a lifetime commitment. And then a few days ago, um, I was in touch with uh, Brad Ryan, who was my associate here for 17 years. And uh, uh, Brad lost both of his parents within two days of each other, just here at the beginning of the year. Uh, unfathomable to me, not in an auto accident, separately. And, uh, and so we talked about that for quite some time, um, but it's a heartbreaking situation for him. And so I'd, I'd like you to join me in prayer. Father, I'm reminded that uh, all of us are just your servants. And to hear uh, and get a message from one who founded this church and hired me to come here, and to hear that his ministry has just gone on and on is a very big encouragement to me. And the father then to hear from Brad, who lost both of his parents, is heartbreaking. I couldn't imagine what that would be like to go through for anyone, but especially for him. And so I lift he and Karen up uh, as they go through this whole process of uh, grieving, et cetera. Um, it's just an overwhelming thought to me to go through such an experience. Father, I pray for those in our own body uh, who are struggling with COVID right now. Some of us easily and some of us with much more difficulty. And I lift them up uh, to the throne of grace. Father, I thank you that the body of Christ exists to encourage one another. And we have been able uh, to do that, and I pray for all of us that if we can encourage anyone going through a difficult time, we should reach out and do so. And now, Father, as we come to your word, I pray that your word will once again penetrate not just our hearts, but our wills, and that we will decide to look at our life differently because what you have said to us. We pray this in the great name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Have you ever been discouraged? 
Have you ever drank water? Have you ever breathed air? I mean, think about that. Have you ever been discouraged? <laughs> I know I have. And, uh, and I know I'm in good company. Uh, Martin Luther, who led the Reformation, had enormous bouts with his discouragement. Charles Spurgeon, probably the greatest single preacher since the Reformation out of London, had tremendous bouts with discouragement. My mentor at Dallas Theological Seminary, Howard Hendricks, had battles with discouragement. You know, I think one of the reasons as pastors we get discouraged is perhaps we're a little bit too idealistic. Warren Worsby says this, the pastor, he said, the pastor, if he is dedicated at all, is a man of ideals. He wants to achieve for the glory of God, and yet no matter how hard he prays and works, it seems that his goals forever elude him. They never really quite arrive. There are other reasons. Uh, when people disappoint us, we get discouraged. That's biblical. Remember what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 4? Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone on to Thessalonica. It's discouraging. When you're unfairly criticized, you become discouraged. When you're disappointed with God, you become discouraged. And there are plenty, many others. But I would say that the number one reason all of us as children of God ever get discouraged is because we're not believing in a good, sovereign, loving God in our life. We don't believe that. And when we don't believe that, we end up becoming discouraged. That's what I want to illustrate this morning. So I invite you to open your Bibles, the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 13. Numbers 13. Israel is about to enter the promised land. They've left Egypt. They've gone through the woods. They're right there. They're right at the doorstep. Depending on who you read, maybe six, eight, nine weeks to get there. Two million people. God has promised the land flowing with milk and honey. They're ready to go in. And it says, then the Lord spoke to Moses and said, send out for yourself men, he said, so that they may spy out on the land of Canaan, which I'm going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, every one a leader among them. There's the task. You can see what they're going to do. He said, I'm going to send them out. And it's, it's an interesting thing because God has already told them what the land of Canaan would be like, and God has already told them, I'm going to give you that land. But he sends them out. And this is interesting because there's a reason I think God is testing for this. In fact, if you look down at verse 17, it says, When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, Go up there into the Negev, then go up into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. How is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with fortifications? So Moses decides, okay, I'm going to be involved. We're going to send them out. That, that's the task. That's what happens. And you kind of know how this whole story works. What are the reports? What is it they come up with once they go out into the land? Well, what you end up seeing here is if you go down to verse 25, when they returned from spying out the land at the end of the 40 days, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh, and they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told him and said, We went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. The fruit, from earlier verses we look at in a moment, is the, they, got a, they took some grapes and cut them down, and they had to put a pole between two men's shoulders and carry the cluster. So notice, it's, they know exactly what God said. Nevertheless, and there's the problem for all of us. Always. We do this over and over again. You go through a set of circumstances, you know what the truth is, and then you say, but, uh, nevertheless, that's what they said. The people who live in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw descendants of Anak there. Now, if you do your homework and study this on your own, those are giants. 
The sons of Anak are giants. So we saw them there. He says, Amalek is living in the land of the Negev, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites are living in the hill country, and the Canaanites are living uh, by the sea, and, um, and he said, and by the side of the Jordan. There are ites everywhere. He said, there's a lot of them. It's interesting uh, what they end up saying here. And then it says, back, I'll go then to uh, verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out. The land, he says, uh, through which we have gone in spying it, it out is a land that devours its own inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw there are men of great size. They also saw Nephilim. Now, if remember, Nephilim is Goliath. We also saw Nephilim. The sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. And he says, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. So you get this idea of what they say they saw. Oh, except for two guys. And one of them speaks here. Verse 30, Caleb. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should go by all means, go up, take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. They all saw the same people. They all saw the same cities. They saw everything the same. Caleb and Joshua said, okay, we did it, now let's go get them. The other ten said, no. The other ten are discouraged. I mean, they're really discouraged. It's interesting having all this the same. It's fascinating. Christians are a lot like this. By the way, like the ten. You ask a Christian, do you know the gospel? Yeah. How you're saved? Simply by grace. What's that mean? That means God does everything. He does everything, and he saves us. I know that. Wow. And a lot of Christians, you go on and you find out they know a lot of Christian doctrines. Things that God has taught to be absolutely true. Many of us know a lot of God's promises. I know his promises. Wow. <laughs> we know the land is flowing with milk and honey. That's what we know. Wow. But when major obstacles occur in our lives, discouragement shows up. Isn't that interesting? You're a child of God. Think of that. You're a child of God. God. Isn't that something? And he says, I'm for you, not against you. I'll never leave you. I work all things out together for your good. He's telling us all this. And you're a child of God. And yet, you get discouraged. It's amazing how we can get discouraged like this. Warren Wiersbe again says this, unbelief always sees the obstacles, faith always sees the opportunities. Well, that's worth remembering. Do you see obstacles or do you see opportunities? Wow. Look, we all know the giants are real. The problems are real. We know that. So are God's promises. See, there's the issue. So what are the results end up being? You know, what are the results of all this? Well, chapter 14, he starts out and says, And then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would we had died in the land of Egypt, uh, or would we had died in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder." Would it not have been better for us to return to Egypt? And they said to one another, let's appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Wow. What does discouragement lead to? They had a night of discouragement. They cried their eyes out. They had open rebellion against God. Hmm. They wanted to appoint a new leader. And they wanted to go back into slavery. Why? They're discouraged. That's what discouragement does to us. Notice how this, never believe a really discouraged person telling you what reality is. 
because they always have the same kind of distortion. And we're all vulnerable to it. That's why I meant Mar Mar mentioned Martin Luther, Charles Spurgeon, Howard Hendricks, me. We're all vulnerable to this. There's no exception to this. <laughs> wow. See, what causes us to be so discouraged? In this case, we have a tendency to follow our eyes and not our ears. We look at the circumstances, but we stop listening to God. As soon as we do that, we're in deep trouble because there are always going to be giants in our lives and difficulties in our lives. That's a great reason why this happens to us. Think of one of the great stories concerning discouragement. 1 Samuel 17. The discouragement for the whole armies of Israel is one man, nine feet, nine inches tall. His name's Goliath. And so the Philistines and the, the Jews are about in this big valley on each hillside and are about to go to war. But in order to save lives, you can challenge, and so Goliath from the Philistines comes down and challenges. And he starts his challenge up right here, challenging them. And if you read this chapter, he goes here, 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 here. And he just keeps getting closer and still offering the same, the same challenge over and over and over again to these people. And what I find so interesting about it is that you end up, it says in 1724, when all the men of Israel saw the men, they fled from him, and they were greatly afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he is going to defy Israel, and it will be the, the king, and if someone can stop him, the king will enrich the man who kills the man. So then enters a shepherd boy, David. And this is interesting. His brother insults him, Everyone is looking and shaking in their armor. Look at this guy. Who are you going to send to go fight this guy? David just glances at Goliath. That's all he does. And he's a teenager. He doesn't say, oh my goodness, look at that guy. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to taunt the armies of the living God? Who is he? Wow. Wow. David knows who God is. You don't taunt the armies of the living God. See, David hears God, and he believes God. A very different kind of approach. Israel's soldiers, they look at Goliath and say, we can't ever do anything here. We do this over and over again in our lives. We go through the same kind of thing. We watch and we let our eyes decide what we're going to do and how this is going to happen to us. And as you know, David was so unafraid that when he even met him, he trash-talked him. I mean, he did. Goliath thought he could intimidate this teenager, and he couldn't intimidate him at all. You see, David believed God. David did not allow the circumstances to discourage him. That can really, that's a great example to us. Another reason we can get discouraged according to this, we listen to the many and not the few. Boy, this is where we get in a lot of trouble. Well, you know what my friend said. That, by the way, isn't that the teenage mantra? How do you decide what's true? Well, my, my friends, we got together and they told me. But that's not truth. See, well, you've got to look at this. Think of it rationally. Ten of them said we can't do this, and some two fanatical guys said we could. And so they ended up the discouraged. Maybe another point that's really important, though, our sinful orientation to bad news rather than good. We really react to bad news. It really helps. Good news sometimes can move us, but bad news can do it all the time. We're oriented that way. Notice in chapter 13, went in verse 28, when he said, Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And there are giants there. That's bad news. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. And then he'd go over to verse 31. It says the men who had gone up said, we're not able to go against this people. They're just too strong for us. That's bad news. If you want to move a whole group of people, give the whole group a lot of bad news. It's interesting. We'll move in unison. 
because of the orientation we have to bad news. They are gigantic. See, this is what they see. Now, is there any good news in this story? Yeah. Look back to verse uh, 27. Of chapter 13, when they said, we went to the land, and he says, the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey. And it has phenomenal fruit. So what do they see? Exactly what God told them. You're going to see a land flowing with milk and honey. And that's why I said, cut some of that fruit down, let everyone see it. You see, you'd think that would really motivate them. I mean, wouldn't, it improve, wouldn't have this improved their diet? I mean, think about it. Manna. Man in the morning, man in the evening. Man at supper time. They're going to be in a land flowing with milk and honey. You think that'd motivate them? No. Doesn't motivate them in any sense of the word. Hmm. Caleb said, let's just go take it, just as God said. That's the way this whole thing works. We have this tendency to follow our eyes and not our ears. We listen to the many, not the few. We are simply... Uh, sinfully oriented to bad news rather than new, and we respond with fear rather than to have courage. Even back in verse 20 of chapter 13, he said, how is the land, is it fat or lean, are the trees in it or not? Make an effort. That phrase there stuck with me. Here's the, here's the idea that you have to have if you're going to have courage instead of discouragement. You've got to make an effort. You see, you can't say under circumstances, why well, believe the Word of God? You have to say, I'm going to make an effort. I'm going to do what I have to do here. You have to make an effort. You see, that's the point. And they, wouldn't, they would not make an effort. <laughs> you know, it's an interesting thing. This whole thing is a setup for them. How'd they get out of Egypt? They fought their way out, right? They were warriors. Ah, no. God did miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle against the most powerful nation on earth. And these two million Jews, <laughs> slaves, get to go free. So just think of what they've seen. Unbelievable. Just incredible. I mean, if you see the Red Sea open up, you walk through it on dry land, and then it closes on the chair. You would think that would impress you. But it tells you something else. What could have gotten God done? He could have just waved his hand, the land's empty, go get it. He could have done it all. It's a test. You're going to be discouraged? You're going to be faithful. See, are you going to be discouraged, or are you going to show courage? Are you going to make an effort? Are you going to do something? It's a test. You see, God could have done this with no problem at all. These are just the ites. The ites aren't the Egyptians. It doesn't work that way. It's an amazing thing. But God says, of all the different tests I can give you, this might be the most important in your spiritual life. And no matter what happened in Egypt, it has no bearing on what's going to happen now in the Promised Land. It's a test. No matter, think of how many things God has brought you through in your whole life. Now, the next time you're facing discouragement, is that all you think about? Nope. I'm not thinking about, I'm just thinking about now. I find myself almost embarrassed how many times God will test me to see if I'll get discouraged, and I still do. It's just like, what is wrong with me? You know about Elijah. Probably the greatest prophet, Elijah. Now, I want you to, I'm just going to read a couple things, just phrases here. Elijah, God answered his prayers, and he made the rain stop. He prayed, and the rain stopped for a long, long, long time. Wow. God fed him by ravens bringing him bread and meat. So the birds showed up and brought him food, and he was sustained by that. He performed miracles by the power of God. The widow's barrel of flour and jar of oil never ran out, ever. Endless supply. Because Elijah was there doing that. He raised the widow's son from the dead. Would that get your attention? Of what God has done through you? 
He called down fire from heaven and consumed the water-soaked sacrifice. And then he took a sword and he killed 300 priests. I mean, think of what this man has done. But Jezebel threatened his life and fear struck his heart. He became totally discouraged. And he was so discouraged that he said, I want to die. I'm that fearful. And he did the worst thing he could do under discouragement. He isolated himself. And then he thought, and he said to God, I think I'm the only one left in 1 Kings 19 who serves you. There's this pity party. That's discouragement. Poor me. God told him, no, shut up. There's 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. So there's at least 7,000 in one of you. How did he get that discouraged that fast? I don't know. But Jezebel scared the bejeebers out of him. But nothing else did. He, and he knew what God had done in his life. Incredible things. And it didn't make any difference. He still found every test to be unique on his own. And the Jezebel test, he got an F one. I'm totally afraid. I'm so discouraged. Hmm. So what characteristics then should we look for in our own life when we find ourselves, we think we're starting to fall into discouragement? Well, they show up here in Numbers. Numbers 14.1. We start crying a lot. We start weeping. You ever been so discouraged to weep? Yeah. We just start crying. Paul told us, so even if we grieve, we don't grieve like those who have no hope. We should never grieve like someone, because what discourages you? Because you think you have no hope. There it is. I mean, what can I do now? He says, we don't grieve like that. Hmm. We trust in God, a God of hope, Christ our hope. Then 14.2, here's a sign of a discouraged person. They complain and whine a lot. Some people are so discouraged over all the years of ministry I've done that virtually, it seems to me, almost every conversation I have starts out with them complaining and whining about something. Yeah, and by the way, if you love complaining and whining, you live in the right place. There's always enough in this world to complain about. I mean, goodness, you're, com you're surrounded by all these people. You see, can you complain about them? Yes. I mean, that's the whole point. We can complain and we whine, and that's what they end up doing. Hmm. And by the way, these people were complainers. You go back to Exodus chapter 15, and all they started is complaining. Now, God said, I'm taking you to the promised land. They get out not that far away, and they keep saying, we're thirsty. We're thirsty. Oh, we're so thirsty. And he gave them water. Next chapter, we're hungry. We're hungry. Even after they had manna, what happened? We don't like it's just one item on the menu. We like quail. So did God give them quail? Yes. You see, but the point was what? We just start this whining, complaining. It becomes part of us. Look at 14.3. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by this sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt. What are they saying? God is killing us. What's that mean? God is not good. He's not as good as I would be if I were God. You see, when we start doing that, you can see how this works. They have a, that's open rebellion against God. I mean, the next verse, so they said to one another, let's appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Well, that's wrong. I can't tell you how many levels. Whoever said this might be hard for an American, God's never, ever supported democratic leadership. Please understand that. Democracy is not God's idea. It's the Greeks' idea. It's not, there's no democracy in the Old or New Testament. Who appoints a leader? God does. I mean, that, let's, just, let's take a vote. And so they said, we want to appoint somebody else. We'd love somebody else to do that. Hmm. See, it, it's so easy to turn discouragement into open rebellion. Do all Christians have great marriages? Nope. I mean, some do. 
but a lot don't. And that's usually when I see them. And I have seen, and I mean this in the right way, for completely non-biblical reasons, people become so discouraged in their marriage, they just say, I'm going to find someone else. I'm going to divorce this person and find another one. Is that what God says? No, but you don't understand how... I understand. It's discouraging. You know, it can be really discouraging, but notice our discouragement can lead us into really bad choices. And it happens all the time. The other thing is, it can go even further. Let me read on here. He says in verse 4, They said to one another, Let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of the assembly of the congregation and the sons of Israel, and Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh. And he said, Of those who would spite out the land. And they tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation, the sons of Israel, and they said, The land, he said, which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them. The Lord is with us. Do not fear them. What's the response? That's called good, sound, biblical insight counseling. Now the response. The congregation said, let's stone them with stones. Isn't that interesting? God speaks to his people. All right, get some stones. We're going to kill these guys. He said, then the glory of the God appeared in the tent of the meeting of the sons of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people spurn me? You can see what's happening now. The consequences of discouragement that happens here. He says, how long will this people spurn me? How long will they not believe in me? Despite all the signs of which I performed in their midst, I will smite them with pestilence and dispossess them. I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they. I'm taking them out. Now, this is a test, understand this, of leadership. Who's their leader? Moses. So who should intercede for his people? Moses. And that's what he does. And when you read the book of Numbers, by the way, it's like a comedy book. Moses spends more time on his knees than Numbers. I mean, it's just endless. People sin, Moses intercedes. People sin, Moses intercedes. People sin, Moses intercedes. But watch what he does this time. Moses said to the Lord, you got to love this. Then the Egyptians will hear of it. And, and he says, for by your strength you brought this people from their midst, and they will tell it to their inhabitants of this land, that they have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of the people. For you, O Lord, are, are seen eye to eye, while your cloud stands over them. And you go before them in a pillar and a cloud and day and a pillar of fire at night. Now, if you slay the people as, as one man, then the nations who have heard of you uh, of your fame will say, because the Lord could not bring people into the land, which he promised by them by oath, therefore he slaughtered them in the wilderness. Now, please understand what he's doing. Wait, don't you think this is bad PR if you're God? I mean, you're God. You overcame the Egyptians. You can't even go into the land of the ites. How does that make you look? I mean, this is interesting how you could say this to God. Moses does. But now I pray, let the power of the Lord be great, just as you have declared. He said, the Lord is slow to anger, abundant loving kindness, forgiveness of iniquity and transgression. But he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generations. Pardon, I pray, the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your loving kindness, just as you also have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. I want to also remind you, God, who you really are. That's exactly what God wanted to hear. That's why there's an intercession. Moses gets an A. It's an interesting thing, by the way, God's standard for leadership. I don't know. Maybe 20, 25 times the people go in complete disobedience, and every time Moses intercedes. Then finally, he's just so sick and tired of him, he can't go on. So he takes his staff and he smacks the rock. As soon as he does, God says, you'll not enter the promised land. That's a failure of leadership. To whom much is given, much is expected. The people got forgiven countless times. Moses once. He doesn't get to enter the land. 
It's an interesting way that God views leadership. So in verse 20, the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word. I have pardoned them again. Hmm. And it doesn't seem to help much. Down in verse 26, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and said, How long shall I bear this evil congregation who are grumbling against me? I have heard the complaints of the sons of Israel, uh, which they are making against me. Say to them as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will surely, he said, do to you. Your corpses will lie in the wilderness, even all your numbered men, according to your complete number from 20 years old and upward, those of you who have grumbled to me. Surely, he said, you shall not come into the land which I swore, uh, swore to you, except Caleb and Joshua. Your children, however, whom you have said would become prey, I'll bring them in, and they will know that the land, this is the land which you rejected. But as for you, your corpses will fall in the wilderness. Your sons shall be shepherds for 40 years in the wilderness, and you will suffer for your unfaithfulness until your corpses will die in the wilderness. There will be consequences to your sin. I've forgiven them, but there are consequences. Boy, is that fact still alive for us now? Can I do anything and God will forgive me? Yes. Can I do anything and escape the consequences? No. This is their consequence. That whole generation is going to die in the land. They're going to die in the wilderness, every single one of them. It's an amazing thing. So they tell, the leadership tells the people, this is the way it is. And typical of God's people after God has spoken judgment on them. Uh, we're ready, Lord. We're, we're ready. But let's go get them. <laughs> Amazing. Verse 39, when Moses spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people mourned greatly. In the morning, however, they rose up early, went to the ridge of the hill country and said, here we are. We have indeed sinned, but we're going up to the place which the Lord has promised. Let's go get them. Uh, too late. He's a long-suffering God, but this is too late. Moses said, when are you? He said, why then are you transgressing the commandment of the Lord? It will not succeed. He said, do not go up, or you'll be struck down by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and Canaanites will be there in front of you, and you will fall by the sword, inasmuch as you have turned your back on following the Lord, and the Lord will not be with you. But he says, but they went up heedlessly to the ridge of the hill country. Neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses left the camp. And then the Amalekites and Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down, struck them, beat them down as far as, and they were all killed. Tremendous consequence to continual discouragement. They never entered the land. The writer of Hebrews loved that idea so much that when he wrote his whole book of Hebrews, he said, that's the danger of walking away from the Lord. You'll never enter the promised land. He called it in Hebrews for us, the faith rest life. You're never going to go in. You'll be a Christian, you'll go to heaven, but you're not going to the promised land. You're never going to have the abundant life Jesus spoke of. You've just pushed this too far. That's what they say. So what should we do then? It's pretty simple for us, just a couple things. One is our faith has to lead to courage, trusting in God's promises. You have to. How do I not get discouraged? My faith has to lead me to action. It has to. I have to believe, and the only way I prove I believe something is to do it. Make every effort, as he says in Numbers. Billy Graham said this, Today, many people are living in bondage of fear. In a recent study, a psychiatrist said that the greatest problem facing his patients was fear. Afraid of going insane, committing suicide, being alone, afraid of heart disease, cancer, disaster, death. We are becoming a nation of fearful people. Down through the centuries, in times of trouble, temptation, trial, and bereavement and crisis, God has brought courage to the hearts of those who love him. The Bible was crowded with assurances of God's help and comfort in every kind of trouble which might cause the human heart to fear. Today, the Christian can come to the scriptures with full assurance that God is going to deliver the person who puts his trust and confidence in God. Christians can lock into the future with promise, hope, and joy without fear, discouragement, or despondency. So I think then the second step for us would be simple. The other tool that God uses, his word. God speaks to us. And then he gave us a tool, prayer. We speak to God. You know, you need to make that a constant discipline of your life. 
The reason I need to, con when God speaks to me and I internalize and meditate on his truth and his word, I need to pray that back to God. And that's what God hears it, so I do. I keep, I have to remind myself what God has said. Because when I stop reminding myself, I get very forgetful. And when I get very, very forgetful, I'm just like Elijah. I get discouraged. You see, I stop listening to what God said, and I start looking at the circumstances of my life. There's a story that goes back hundreds of years. I've heard it ever since I became a Christian, but it's so appropriate here. They've updated it lately, and they call it a garage sale. And it says that Satan had a garage sale. And it said he marked all his tools with their appropriate price, hatred, envy, lust, deceit, lying, and pride. Laid apart from all these was a rather harmless looking but well-worn tool marked with a much higher price than the rest. A buyer pointed it out and asked, what is that tool? And Satan said, oh, that's discouragement. Why is it priced so high, he asked. He said, because it's more useful to me than any of the others. I can pry open a man's heart with it. And he said, and when I, and he said, and when I can't get near to him with the other tools I have, I can get inside him with discouragement. Once inside, I can make him do whatever I choose. It's a badly worn tool because I use it on almost everyone. Very, very few know that it even belongs to me. The devil's price was so high that the tool of discouragement was never sold. He continues to use it to this day on God's people. That's discouragement. Next time you're discouraged, think of numbers. Think of David and Goliath. Think of Elijah. And then react appropriately. Let's pray. Father, I'm sure someone in this room is discouraged today. All of us in this room have been discouraged, at least in the past. It's so easy for us to lose sight of what you've said and constantly, constantly sort of bewitched by the circumstances of our life. It guides everything we end up doing, and we end up crying and complaining and rebelling against you because we become so discouraged. Father, let your word this morning penetrate our souls so that we can do a preemptive strike with discouragement. When we start to feel ourselves that way, may we get ourselves back onto your word and your promises. And then may we act in faith on the basis of what you have said, not what we're going through. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. is all around me and he seems far beyond me if doubts would capture my soul what can I do where can I go when darkness feels overwhelming and fears would try to find me in confusion and so much unknown what will I do where will I go on my knees I pray to you, my God. Show me your will, show me your way. In the midst of the storm, your word comes to me, and I hear my Father say, Be still, be still, and know that I am God. Safe in the power of my love. Just be still. With sorrow and tears arrest me, my strength feels taken from me. With 
pain would drown all my hope. I know what I'll do. I know where I'll go. On my knees I pray to you, my God. Show me your will. Show me your way. In the midst of the storm, your word comes to me and I hear my Father say, You are safe in the power of my love. In your weakness, I am your strength. In your doubt, I am your hope. In your fear, I am your peace. Your tears I have known, you're never alone. I'll always be near. I love you, I'm here. So be God, you are safe in the power of my love. Be still. Be still. When you face discouragement, as we just sang, be still. Trust God in his promises, and let us act in faith accordingly.